You're free to start whenever you want. Very good. Well, well, good afternoon. Uh, afternoon here. I'm not sure where it is, it, where everyone else is coming from, but um, I'm happy to be here. My name is Diana Lunsford, and I've been an OT for a really long time, which makes me old. So um, I won't tell you how, how long, but, but long enough. I, I have um, a, a doctoral degree in occupational therapy and um, a master's degree in education. But um, I started my career as a generalist, and I did a little. Um, fell in love with rehab, rehabilitation of the upper quadrant, which really does start from the neck distally to the ear. And um, I sat for my certification on top of my OT degree for my hand certification, which is a special here in the state. So um, I've been a CHT for a long time. I still consider myself a generalist with a specialty in hands because I've done a little bit of everything. So um, I hope there's something new for you in this and I want this to be very informative and casual. So um, I tend to speak quickly and if you have a question, I guess there's a chat room and um, Dr. Barlow is going to help um, stop me and interrupt me if should there be questions. So feel free to do that. And just before you start, I muted everyone to cut down on the background noise. So you just have to unmute yourself if, when you want to ask a question. Okay, go ahead. Oh, what's happening? Okay, so. Um, here, and, and I know there might be differences. So my context is, of course, the state. So that's what I'm gonna be starting from and giving you some background and explanation uh, with regards to what um, splints, as they used to be called, looks like. Um, there's a big initiative and push to call this an orthosis, uh, a device that we're gonna be talking about. Um, because of reimbursement and getting paid for this. So who can provide an orthosis? Um, here in uh, the States, occupational therapists can provide an orthosis, physical therapists can provide an orthosis, and then there are specialists, and then that's all they do, and they are certified orth orthotists. Actually, that's what my husband does. So. Um, Physicians can also do this, uh, but in for the most part, these are the these are the folks that are doing it. And if you think about our educational background, um, we get the anatomy, we get the biomechanics and the kinesiology, we understand disease, the process of injuries, and along with the psychosocial aspects of disease and illness. And I think that's probably one of the things that OT really. Um, excels in is understanding that regardless of your injury, the disease process, the whatever uh, limitation that you have, that there is a psychological and a psychosocial impact to uh, that limitation. So we understand those things. We're exposed clinically. We can problem solve and reason our way through a process. So that really makes us educated to be able to provide orthoses and, and one of the best educated, I think, to provide these. Um, and in our educational programs, we are doing orthotic training with our students. So they're gonna get some hands-on as well. So like I said, there's this, this change in terminology um, from uh, um, splinting to orthosis. So I'm gonna be doing my best to try and use the word orthosis, but as I said, I've been doing this a long time and I grew up using the word splint. So if I slip once in a while, forgive me. Um, an orthosis, IS is singular. So if we're talking about one, it's orthosis. If we're talking about multiple, it's orthoses, S-E-S. And if I'm describing something as orthotic, I'm gonna do orthotic fabrication or this orthotic device, um, it is, it is a, a different word or term. So some additional terminology that you'll hear me uh, use potentially today. Um, if something is custom fabricated, that means that it has been created from scratch. So from uh, essentially nothing, a pattern. Um, if something is custom fit, however, it already exists and then we modify it to fit better um, or we adjust it. Uh, it could also be called prefabricated. Um, uh, prefabricated 
typically means I, I say I tease and say one size fits none because oftentimes prefabricated comes off the shelf in a box and there's really not an op option or opportunity to make any adjustments to it. And as we all know, we're built very differently. So um, that's, a, that's what's called a prefabricated uh, orthosis. We use L codes and L codes are identified for reimbursement purposes. So there is a dollar amount attached to this code and this code is identified based on the anatomy that it's covering. So if you look down here at the bottom of my screen, we have FO. FO is a finger orthosis. If we go up here to EWHO, we've got elbow, wrist, hand orthosis. And so you can see where I'm going with this. And we, as you follow along, if we go all the way up, you are looking at a shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, finger orthosis. So these are pretty typical and pretty commonly used um, in the hand therapy world. And like I said, these are also used for um, purposes of reimbursement and billing for uh, the specific orthoses. So I want you all to take a look at your hand and I want you to get comfortable with um, the anatomy a little bit. And I don't know where, where you all are at in terms of um, your programs but, uh, or your, your um, careers, but uh, this will just be a little bit of a reminder for all of us in terms of our anatomy. So if you take a look at your hand and put your hand in front of you and just let your hand relax almost in a, uh, what we call a resting hand position in a cupped position. You take your finger, your opposite of your opposite hand, and you run it along the line of the most middle finger, the longest finger. There is a natural arch that occurs in a resting hand position, and that's called your longitudinal arch. It's it begins at the capitate, and if you take that opposite hand again and run it down the third metacarpal, so one, two, three, the long finger, third metacarpal. Where that metacarpal stops, you'll find that there's a little recess there. That's your capitate bone. And that's where that longitudinal arch begins. And it ends at the distal tip. So it's really the, the index and the long finger with the long finger being the longest point of the longitudinal arch. The distal transverse arch, I want you to turn your palm up and I want you to look at your hand and then I want you to bring your hand into a position that looks like this, a tabletop position, what I call a tabletop position. You've got a crease, the most distal palmar crease. Um, your, your distal palmar arch is happening right around that crease. And what the distal palmar arch is important uh, is because of the cupping aspect of the hand. So if you reach around onto something, your index finger, your little finger, really enhance that distal transverse arch in order to hold onto something. That's a really important arch for function. The proximal transverse arch is happening at the um, the uh, carpal row and uh, right around the area of the wrist. And that's a much more stabilizing arch than the distal palmar arch. So you're going to get a lot more mobility with the distal palmar arch than you do the proximal uh, transverse arch. Some bony prominences, you know, the hand itself, the upper extremity really um, has a lot of vulnerable spots, uh, if you will, for uh, providing orthoses because there's a lot of bony prominences that are at risk to be irritated by uh, thermoplastic uh, orthotic materials. So really important to be aware of um, what these uh, bony prominences are, where they are, and how we can address them. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit um, briefly in a, a little bit here, so. Dr. Lunsford, can I interrupt you for one minute? Sure. Um, Daniela can't see the slides. Is anyone else having trouble seeing the slides? You have to unmute yourself. Sorry, everyone. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I, un I unmuted everyone. Is anyone else having trouble seeing the slides? No. No? Okay, no. everyone else can see them? 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, all right, um, Daniela, I'll continue to text you in the chat box, okay? I don't see Daniela. Oh. Okay, Dr. Lunsford, you can continue. Okay. Um, so, so a little bit more about the anatomy. Um, just, just some some common terms that that we use. Um, the we've got uh, when it comes to the hand, the most distal part of the hand. Um, the, or the fingertip, um, uh, as opposed to the proximal part of the finger. So we've got your proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx, or it is also called P1, P2, and P3. Um, the most distal joint is the distal interphalangeal joint, so your DIP. I, I, Try not to say dips and pips. Um, DIPs and PIPs are more, more common. So then the more proximal joint is your proximal, can you guys see my finger? Your proximal interphalangeal joint. So distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint. So DIPs and PIPs. Um, of course, the thumb just has one joint uh, distally as opposed to two in the fingers. That's your IP of the thumb. And then of course, we've got the MP of the thumb right here. I'm trying to see how you might see that best. And then um, the CMC where the metacarpal meets the carpal bones. So um, again, just understanding the terminology is really important, but also understanding that um, there's pressure with the bony prominences. Um, there are nerves that are very superficial and easily pinched under an orthosis. Um, the vascular supply can very easily be compromised with an improper fit. Um, and we need to be um, visually aware of what the hand, especially the distal part of the upper extremity in the hand looks like when we've got um, an orthosis on. And it's our responsibility to be sure that we are um, going to uh, appropriately provide uh, an orthosis. So when we talk about orthosis, we describe it uh, based on several things. Now I'm going to go through this and there's a lot of slides on this. And here's what I want you all to know about this. Don't, don't get hung up on remembering everything because different parts uh, of the country, different parts of the world may use different terminology, but but these are very common and it, sh it should be something that you should be aware of, but don't get hung up on trying to remember all of it. So when we describe an orthosis, it's often described for, um, for whether or not it crosses a joint or just protects the bone. So if you look at this first picture on, if I'm looking at my screen on my left, that would be considered an articular or joint, another word for joint, um, orthosis, because it is crossing multiple joints. It's crossing the, um, the uh, um, MP joint of the thumb, it's crossing the wrist joint. So it is articular. Um, as opposed to the photo on the right, which is not crossing over that shoulder joint and it's not crossing the elbow joint. That is a non-articular orthosis. That is a humeral fracture orthosis and that orthosis is just providing support for the humerus itself. So, so articular versus non-articular. And orthosis is also described uh, and named for its location. So whether it's a joint, a set of bones or body part, um, for the intent of its use. So again, the photo on the left, that would be a, um, could be called a wrist thumb orthosis, as opposed to the one on the right, which would be uh, considered a humeral fracture orthosis. Mm -hmm. um, and the one on the left is, is really called a thumb spica. So more describing. Um, so this particular splint um, or orthosis is, uh, described partially for the joints that it is acting on. So this is a mobilizing orthosis, meaning that it, it is used for causing motion, to helping motion to occur um, in whatever area. So um, this orthosis also immobilizes a joint. So in this particular orthosis, um, 
it goes up. You can't see see how far it goes, but it goes up the forearm. Um, it, it's considered a forearm based um, index finger, MP metacarpal phalangeal joint extension dynamic or mobilization orthosis. That is a mouthful, and I know it is. But if you really look at each one of those words, it really describes what that orthosis does. It, it's articular, it crosses uh, a couple of joints. It's crossing the wrist joint, it's crossing the carpal joints. Um, it's acting on the index finger at the, at the metacarpal joint to pull that joint up in extension. So it's describing the action. And it is a mobilizing or a moving uh, orthosis that is causing motion. Um, and so that is the name. So the design of the splint can have many names as well. It could be a gutter splint, which looks like a gutter. It might be a spica, which would take us back to our previous slot slide, which is like a spike or a one, one finger um, orthosis commonly used for a thumb spica. It might be a static orthosis, dynamic, static, progressive, or serial. And we're going to talk about uh, these last few here in a moment. And orthosis is also going to be described for its intent. Why are we placing the orthosis on this particular person in this particular area? Are we trying to protect something? Are we immobilizing? Are we trying to get something moving? such as this orthosis that you see on this slide. Are we trying to restrict the motion? Maybe some motion is allowed, but we don't want full motion just yet. So we'll, we're gonna discuss those here in a moment as well. So these are the three that we just talked about, described for their purpose. Immobilization, mobilization, uh, restriction. So if we are looking to immobilize, these are important. So all the descriptors, I think are important to be familiar with. Whether or not you should know all of them in great detail, that comes with time and understanding and whatever culture you're coming from and what is being used uh, for the orthoses in the area that you, you're working. But the purpose, the purpose is the same, I think, all the way around the board. So um, an immobilization orthosis can do all of these things. It might be immobilizing someone to prevent them from deformity. So if someone has, say, a radial nerve palsy, let me give you this example. And I'm not sure if you know what that means, but if someone has a radial nerve palsy, the radial nerve comes up into the forearm and uh, the radial nerve feeds the extensor tendons. So the radial nerve, uh, I'll, causes the extensor muscles to lift the wrist and to lift the MPs in extension. If, so, if that is not working and someone has a radial nerve palsy, they won't be able to lift their wrist or their MPs. They might be able to do their fingers because those are other, other joints, but they won't be able to, they'll be able to do this with the fingers bent, but they won't be able to lift the fingers all the way up and they won't be able to lift the wrist. Well, that's a problem because if they're allowed to sit like this, what happens to all these tissues on this side of the forearm? They shorten, right? So, so that they're gonna shorten and at some point, if that's not addressed, that position is going to become fixed or tight in that area. So an immobilization splint in this case might prevent that deformity and bringing that wrist and those fingers up into a position that will maintain the length on the contralateral side. We might immobilize something that is irritated. If you've twisted your ankle ever, um, you might wrap that up um, with an ACE wrap where it has very limited motion um, to, to relieve the pain. So we might immobilize using an orthosis for a tendonitis, a wrist tendonitis, an elbow tendonitis, um, or an acute strain. Um, in the case of uh, osteoarthritis, specifically CMC, thumb CMC osteoarthritis, um, we might immobilize that joint because it's unstable and it might uh, increase the function to have it immobilized so that that person can bring their fingers into a pinch position, which can be very difficult to do with CMC osteoarthritis. Um, which brings us to the next one as well, to stabilize. So CMC is another good example of that, but also to support protect in the case of a fracture. Like our first um, 
image of the humeral fracture brace. So that is also called a Sarmiento, and that was named, I think, for the, the um, surgeon that created or, or, or the person that, that developed it. But it basically provides a compressing force around the fracture to bring the two parts of the bone together. So, um, so potentially immobilizing um, a healing fracture or a, a, an area that has had a surgical procedure. And maybe the tendon has been stitched together, but the tendon isn't supposed to move for a few weeks because it'll pull apart. So we need to immobilize it so we could be stabilizing a surgical, post-surgical situation. In the images here, you can see that this person has some rheumatoid arthritis and we've got ulnar deviation really going in the fingers. So we are correcting an existing deformity in this case. You may see this with children or adults with cerebral palsy or um, some other sort of insult to the brain, um, like a traumatic brain injury where there are flexion contractures and things going on. So we might be able to bring that out and immobilize in a position that corrects that deformity. And then uh, again, in the um, directional control, uh, as you see with the rheumatoid arthritis as well. So that was immobilization. Now let's talk about mobilizing. Mobilizing meaning moving. So there's a lot of reasons to mobilize an area. We might be remodeling scar. We used to think that once a scar healed that it's done. Well, what we know now is, is scars um, definitely have a time frame for healing, but it can be longer in some people. And even scars that um, might appear mature, might still have an opportunity to remodel or, or stretch and lengthen. So um, remodeling scar in an area that uh, has been burned or has had multiple surgeries and, and has developed a lot of scarring, we might mobilize, put someone in a mobilizing orthosis to do that. Uh, elongating tissues for the case of adhesions, contractures, and tightness. So that's pretty self-explanatory to lengthen the tissue. We might be putting some sort of, of uh, mobilizing uh, orthosis on, uh, which will in turn also, may also increase joint motion. Um, we can realign or maintain a ligament profile. So um, if, if we've got a ligamentous injury, whether it's a rupture or a partial tear, uh, a surgically repaired area, um, we might be mobilizing with an orthosis that helps to realign that area and make sure that it's stable. Um, substitute for weak or absent motion. So um, if I go back to my example of radial nerve palsy and I've got someone that looks like this, and I don't have an image of this, but we make an orthosis that goes on on the back side here all the way down and lifts the wrist and then attaches with some rubber bands to the fingers. So the flexor surface is still working with radial nerve palsy, but remember we said that the extensor surface wasn't. Well, the rubber bands act as extensors and rubber band those fingers back up. So now they can grasp because those flexors are working, but the rubber bands bring them back up. So it is substituting for the muscles that are not doing the work until they return. Um, so that might, might be a reason to put a mobilizing orthosis on someone. Uh, and mobilizing orthosis may help to maintain a reduction in a, a fracture that is within the joint. The very last picture on the bottom is an orthosis that has been used in the past for um, maintaining a, an intraarticular fracture reduction um, so that that person can still move the finger along the arc, but at the same time, there's a little bit of traction being held through this mobilizing force, this rubber band traction, to keep the fracture within the joint aligned. Uh, and we, we also provide a mobilizing orthosis for resistance for exercise. And that is what you see in the middle image there. Uh, that is uh, one way to exercise. Again, the resistance is coming down, so they are exercising their extensors of the thumb. How are we doing so far, okay? We good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm seeing that life now, yeah. 
Oh, very good. Okay, that makes me happy. Um, so last but not least, another reason, another purpose for uh, using an orthosis is to restrict motion. So lots of reasons to restrict motion after a, an injury or repair of a nerve, of a tendon, of a bone. Um, lots of time, what we know, what research tells us is that early mobilization, early active motion um, in a lot of these cases, especially with fractures, really helps with the healing process. It increases the blood flow. Um, it helps reduce swelling, all good things for healing. Um, but we some, sometimes don't want uh, those areas going into an extreme of the motion. Maybe we just want a little bit of motion. So an orthosis can provide a restricted amount of motion. Um, it, it may provide stability and joint alignment, uh, restricted motion, and may also assist with functional use of the hand. So um, the, the little image on the left of just the finger is mimicking a uh, uh, an orthosis that can be used uh, for a um, swan neck deformity. A swan neck deformity is a hyperextension of the PIP joint and flexion of the DIP. I'm, I'm a poor example to, to really demonstrate it, but what that orthosis does is instead of allowing that PIP joint to hyperextend, it holds it into a slightly flexed position allows full function and flexion, but restricts the motion and extension to keep it from hyperextending. The image at the bottom is a um, restricted uh, motion splint that's often used for an extensor tendon uh, injury. And this particular splint um, allows for some flexion, but as you can see, it stops. It's got that bar on the bottom that allows for this much motion, so it stops the full amount of MP flexion. And the image on the top is uh, called the relative motion splint. And um, there's various reasons to do that orthosis. And um, uh, that might be something uh, to consider uh, looking into. Uh, it's, it's been a great help in improving both flexion and extension of the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the MP joints. So to splints, there's the word splints again, that should say orthoses. Um, so there are what we call static, dynamic, and static progressive orthoses. Your dynamic and static progressive orthoses will fall into your mobilizing orthoses, okay? So they're gonna help with motion. Your static orthosis will fall into the immobilizing um, category. The static orthosis is probably the most common. You saw that it's got lots of indications. There's lots and lots of reasons to immobilize. Healing, edema, um, stability, alignments, maintaining tissue length, lots of reasons like we've discussed. Your um, dynamic uh, orthoses are considered dynamic when they have a component of uh, usually, usually some sort of um, moving part, and in a lot of cases, we use a rubber band traction of some sort, a rubber band um, movable part. Uh, our research is telling us that to mobilize, the best way to do it really is static progressive, to have a static progressive approach. So if you look at what static means and you think about what progressive means, you can almost guess what that might look like. So your static progressive is going to place someone in a position that puts them, say, on stretch at my MPs, and I'm, it's gonna keep me there for a while, and then it's gonna come off, and I'm gonna move it down to keep me at the next level for a while. So I'm going to progress this person in a static uh, orthosis. So it's called static progressive orthosis, as opposed to having like some sort of traction, rubber band or um, fishing line traction on um, your orthosis. That would be considered dynamic. So now that I've said that, what do you see here? And maybe you guys can just text, uh, type these up in the text box. Number one, look at number one. Is that static? Is it dynamic? Or is it static progressive? What do you guys think about number one? Number one is static. Static. Who said static? Yeah. 
give yourself a pat on the back. Round of applause. <laughs> That's right. Number one is static. It's just immobilizing, isn't it? How about, yeah. how about number two? Static, dynamic, or static progressive? Progressive. Progressive. Is actually a re a restricted um, orthosis, but it is a dynamic, and it's considered dynamic, even though it has a restricted component. It's considered dynamic because of the rubber band traction that's on there. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. How about number three? Now you might look at number three and think, "Oh, that's just a little bit of uh, Velcro there." That's actually considered an orthosis. It's called a finger trapper. Uh, what do you guys think about that one? Static, dynamic, static, progressive. Any guesses? Come on, be brave. Static, progressive. Yes, static, progressive. So that little piece of Velcro actually comes undone and you can tighten that up. So with that finger trapper, you can start where it is comfortable for the person and then you can tighten it up till you get as much motion as possible. So that is indeed static progressive. Number four, static, dynamic, static progressive. Dynamic. Yes, ma'am, dynamic. You've got rubber bands there, which is causing a movable part. And then of course, I failed to take away number five. It is static there. It's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> static. You're right. right. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. So now those are all everything we've talked about. What's that? Are we good? It's fine. Let's continue. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Let's continue. You can continue. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing all, all of that. So, um, so we've talked about thermoplastic splints and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the properties here in a moment, but I want to mention that there are also soft orthoses. Um, soft orthoses can be made out of a variety of materials and variety of thicknesses. And for some folks with certain disorders, these are very, very helpful and very much um, appreciated. They might have some stretch um, and pr provide warmth. Um, we have uh, a lot of folks that like to have a soft CMC splint for their osteoarthritis. It keeps the joint warm. It provides stability, but it's not hard against the joint. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, some of those orthoses are also really nice to be used with our um, folks who have cerebral palsy or some tone changes. Um, again, the warmth can provide a decrease in the spasticity. I'm not gonna go into big detail here about force and torque, but what you should know is especially a mobilizing or static progressive splint or orthosis can cause force and torque on joints, especially the, uh, of course, the articular splints, the splints that are crossing joints. So, so even the static orthoses can, can cause force and torque. Um, when you get into your mobilizing and dynamic and you're providing lines or, or angles that pull on something, the direction of the force matters. We're gonna talk about that here in a moment. Um, and of course, these types of orthoses can be very, very, uh, we must be very, very careful with these to make sure we are providing an appropriate line of force so that we're not stressing or traumatizing, stabilizing structures like ligaments. Um, and also that uh, we aren't causing further uh, tissue damage with an orthosis that is too aggressive and causing an increase in edema or irritation to the tissues. So uh, most orthotics are a lever system, right? We've got a fixed axis and a fulcrum, especially those that are articular and crossing joints. So it's important to understand that the length of the orthosis matters when it's placed on the person, because um, that influences the mechanical advantage, the lever arm 
of the uh, orthosis itself. The depth of the orthosis matters. If we are too shy, we risk instability of the orthosis. If we go too deep uh, on our orthosis and it comes up over, we'll never be able to make contact using our straps because the straps will float within the space. So it really, there really are some things that we want to look at and we're going to talk about this. Angles of application. So A and B, if you look at that line of pull and we look at that thumb and the top part of the thumb as our straight line, you can see we should be about 90 degrees pulling from that thumb. That's an important degree of, uh, for us to be aware of, that 90 degree angle of pull to the lever itself. Um, that, that pull should also be centered over the digit or the part of the limb that it is acting upon. Again, we want to provide the appropriate force in the appropriate direction so we're not stressing the surrounding tissues. If we're mobilizing a single digit that um, in the fingers, if you all take your hands and you just do a what we call a straight fist where the DIPs are not bent, they're not tucked in, they are straight, you'll see that all those fingertips kind of verge towards one point in the wrist and it is towards the base of the thumb at a bone called the scaphoid. So if you're mobilizing a single digit, we want to mobilize in the direction toward the scaphoid to prevent a shearing force uh, at the MP. And of course, we are observing when we fabricate and provide orthoses. We're observing the skin for color changes. A blue finger is unacceptable. That's not what we want. We can't compromise the vascular supply. We are looking for an increase in swelling. If, if we put too much stress on a joint, it may um, swell up, which causes more internal pressure, which can affect healing and, of course, cause trauma, uh, trauma response. Um, and, of course, an increase in pain. So most folks will tell you, I'm not going to wear that. It hurts. Well, if it hurts, let's investigate why it hurts. But sometimes we have uh, folks that are nonverbal or don't understand or tolerate pain because you, the healthcare provider, told them they should wear it. So they tolerated it um, because they were told to um, all the while causing damage to the tissues underneath. So it's our job to use our obser observation skills to see what's going on with the tissue. So I very seldom will give, provide an orthosis and let someone go away immediately. I usually keep them hanging around to talk with them, to give them instructions, to then remove the orthosis so that I can visually see and observe the skin and do a skin check. I think that's really important and we should be very aware of what we're doing. So we talked about the length being important in leverage. The length of especially a distal orthosis, we're going to talk about the distal orthosis right now, two-thirds up the forearm. So if we break the forearm up from styloids to meta, uh, epicondyle, right? So from the, the medial lateral epicondyle all the way to the wrist styloids, if we break that section up into thirds, one, two, three, your forearm orthosis should go two thirds up the forearm. Um, adequate depth, so it should be deep enough to come to the edges of the forearm um, so that we don't lose stability. Now, this says pad vulnerable areas such as the styloids. If we can cut around the styloids, we want to cut around the styloids. If it really narrows our splint and we lose stability, we can heat those up and pull those out. What we don't want to do, and, and I'm okay with padding, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to take an orthosis that is already touching the styloids. Okay, follow me here. It's touching the bones, the bony prominences of the wrist already, and then add padding. I want you to think about putting on a shoe with a sock Put, put on a shoe without a sock and it's tight. The shoe is already tight and you don't have a sock on. Now I want you to go and add, would you go and put a great big thick sock on and try and get your foot into that same shoe that was tight without the sock? Of course not, that's silly, isn't it? It's already tight, it was tight without the sock. Why would we add another sock? It doesn't make it more comfortable, it makes it more tight. So I've seen this happen a lot of times. We've got pressure already 
on an orthosis touching bony prominences and I see people go in and add padding. It just made it tighter. So it needs to be really opened up. And if you open it up enough and it still still has a little bit of irritation, it's okay to add padding, but you don't want to add padding to areas that are already tight. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Um, straps. Lots of different straps, sizes and strapping, but straps should be wide enough to distribute the compressive forces. Um, and in, in spots where we need to hold down joints. So there are, are some appropriate spots. Um, the borders of your orthosis should be flush with the edges of the skin. So they shouldn't come up and they shouldn't go below. They should be flush with the edges. And then your strapping will be making contact with the skin surface. And that's gonna hold your orthosis in place and keep it from migrating and moving around. We use lots of tools in hand therapy um, you may or may not use these tools. So, sometimes you use what you have, right? You have to use what's available to you. Here I use a lot of heat guns, scissors, hole punchers, heat guns. I use lots of those. It's up there twice. Um, um, tools like hole punch and wire benders, pliers, even drills. Our material is all low temperature thermoplastic and that means that we don't need an oven to cook it. We can cook it in hot water. Um, we have lining and padding, um, lots of different strapping uh, and things like that. Our low temperature materials have specific characteristics. Once you start using different materials, if you are using a variety of things, you'll get familiar with what it is you need for what types of uh, issues you're having. And I'll give you a couple examples. There is pellet form. Um, that is exactly what it sounds like. It comes in little pellets and you can create an orthosis out of it. You can also use those pellets to build up handles for uh, various tools and supplies uh, for someone who might need that. But the material can come perforated or solid. It can come in different colors and different finishes, different thicknesses. I wouldn't necessarily put a super thick material on say an older adult with very thin skin that doesn't provide a lot of, doesn't need a lot of stabilizing force um, because that might be an irritation uh, or I might be too heavy for that older adult. But I may choose a thicker material for say someone who has cerebral palsy and has an increase in tone because I might want something thicker. There is moisture issues. We use a cotton sock, an old, old uh, clean sock up underneath a lot of our orthoses. Tell our, our patients that that can help wick away the, the moisture. Plastic can be hot. It can cause moisture on the skin. Too much moisture over a period of time can cause the skin to break down. We don't want that. Durability, flexibility, self-finishing edges, bonding, coating, all different characteristics of different materials. Drapeability and elasticity for something that we want to be very conforming. And memory. Memory is one of those characteristics uh, that is used a lot for static progressive splints or orthoses. So memory means that I can take that splinting material and I can heat it up and stretch it out and, oh, I don't like what I've got. I can put it back in the water and it goes back to its original shape. It has memory of what its original shape is. Not all materials do that. Many materials, if you've heat the, heated them up and you've stretched them out and it isn't the angle or isn't fitting the way you want it, a lot of times they're stretched out and, and um, they become more difficult to work with and fix. Where something with memory works really well for um, the therapist who is new to uh, fabricating orthoses and can be really helpful because you can reheat it. But it is very helpful uh, in the case of uh, static progressive uh, orthoses because you the plan is to change that angle of or position in order to progress your patients. Of course we have special challenges that we have to consider as therapists. One of those is the person with short attention span. So as we get better with making orthoses, fabricating orthoses, it helps for those kinds of clients. Sometimes we get somebody who has a very short attention span and cannot uh, sit and um, you're new and it just makes it a lot more difficult. Splint size, making a little orthosis for a little person is much more difficult 
than making something large for a big person um, and trying to get all the angles right and, and maintain um, the posture that you're looking for. So reflexes, someone has primitive reflexes that are not integrated and are kicking in that can make getting the position that you want difficult as well as tone. Um, and then there's Houdini, that's the, that's the kiddo especially who needs the orthosis for whatever reason but can get out of everything. They can just find their way out of their orthosis that they're supposed to be wearing for a good part of the day. So um, we have lots of different ideas and, and ideas sharing with, with uh, those populations so that we can try and, and get uh, adherence to their wearing schedule. There's different ways to cool off the material. You know, we make material and some materials cool off quickly. Some of them take a little bit longer. Um, there is cold spray, um, which is bad for the ozone. So I don't use that, but it's still out there and available. We put our TheraBand in a freezer. And if we've got a position that we want and we don't want that person to move, we might take the cold TheraBand and wrap it around the orthosis and that cools it um, pretty quickly and gets it in the position. The other thing to, that you can also do is very carefully, if it's holding enough of a shape, run it under cold water and that will set it. Because remember, we're putting it in hot water to heat it up, cold temperature, cold water will um, then set your mold. And then this is, this is a, a good acronym for working on getting your process started. So you wanna create a pattern. I like to use a paper towel pattern, measure it on my, my person and put it on how I want because paper towels are cheap, lint material is not, um, and then refine that pattern. So if it's not, I cut it out and I put it on them and it's not exactly what I want, I can redo it and, and make it better. Um, choose the material that I'm going to use, whether I want something that has memory or something that drapes really nicely because I've got a, a fracture and I'm trying to really hold it into place. Um, find, that, find that material. I'm going to heat it and cut it. And then once it's on, I'm going to look at the fit of it. I'm going to evaluate. Is it hitting that bony prominence? Do I need to clear that, um, that uh, nerve area that I might be irritating? So I want to pay attention to that. Um, then I'm going to strap it at any components that are appropriate and, and are called for. And then I'm going to survey or analyze my completed orthosis. I'm going to instruct my, my, my client or my patient, make sure that they understand how they're supposed to wear it, when they're supposed to wear it, what things they might have to be looking for if they have, say, an insensate extremity. They can't feel the extremity because it's numb from for whatever reason. Um, if they remove it, what should they be looking at? They should be looking for red areas. They should be looking for somewhere where the skin might be irritated, things of that nature. So I'm going to educate my client and survey my completed orthosis to make sure before they walk out the door that it is as good as it can be um, and that I can make any adjustments necessary. Questions? That was fast. I talk fast. Does anyone have any questions? No. Was this basic too basic for you guys? Was this was this helpful? Can you provide me some feedback? It was, this is Regina. It was very helpful, um, a good refresher, and I learned some new things. But what I would like to ask is, um, what is one type of material that you can recommend to make most of these splints? Because here in Guyana, we have to source them online. And then when they come in, sometimes some are not good. And I like the idea of the, the memory splint, but do you have like a special name for it so that we can search the product? Sure. So let me just let me just preface this with I don't work for any of the or orthotic companies. Um, Got it. Okay. Um, there are two that that I like, and they come in different thicknesses. One of them is called Taylor. I believe it's spelled T A I L O R. Taylor splint. Now, Taylor yes. Splint does not not necessarily have memory, but Taylor Splint is good 
for um, not showing a lot of fingerprints. It gives you enough work time uh, and that kind of thing. So I really like Taylor Splint. And then the other one that I use um, for uh, memory is called Orifit, O-R-I-F-I-T, Orifit. And that comes also in different thicknesses, different perforations, and that does have, they have one that has memory. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure. You, it's a FISA. Um, I'm also an occupational therapist in Guyana. Um, so I'm currently working with a lot of children. I guess I'll be working with them for the next few months. And I'm not, some of them require splinting, but like my colleague said, we don't have a lot of that here. So if I had to make recommendations in terms of what would be the preferable material to, to buy for these kids, and I mean like from babies just a few months up until 14, 16 years, and you, what those same spent material names that you gave to us just now, would those be recommended for, the, for that age group as well? So, so Afisa, what I would say is with a lot of kiddos, neoprene is, is, um, can be very helpful. Do you have access to neoprene and a sewing no, machine? No, we do not. <laughs> okay, because, because those, neoprene, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, those we would have to buy, yes. Um, uh, we, we, here, the services, we work with the government system, so, if they provide them, we use them. If the family can afford them, we allow them to purchase it as well. So, so you know, some of the materials that I refer to can, can always be, be used by every age, but the thermoplastic materials, we just have to be cautious of with the kiddos, right? Because kids, kids don't think twice about moving and pulling things off and shifting them around. Um, into the spaces that that they're not supposed to be. So if someone isn't monitoring them, um, then it become can become problematic in terms of of harming the, the surrounding tissues or or the you know um, not doing what they intended to do. So so yes, those materials would be appropriate. However, I would say we use a lot of neoprene here for our younger. Um, clients because for that reason and because usually you don't need a real firm plastic to maintain a position with a kiddo you know a lot of times like our thumb and palm orthoses that's just made out of a little bit of a uh, um, neoprene material that we sew together and it loops around the wrist and pulls the thumb out it doesn't take a, a lot of force to do that on a, a small child or in right and it's safer on the skin you know so I guess I would I guess I would say look at what your local resources are, and is there something um, locally that that might serve? You know, this is where your OT brains get get rolling here because you know how creative can you be um, with what you have? And and I've done some international work, and the one thing that we really always try and do when we go overseas, look at what the local resources are. Like we can come in and bring in all these fabulous things that people have donated, but when they're gone, then they're gone. Now, what are the locals going to do? What are the local therapists left with? And so um, a lot of times I, I ask them, what are your local resources? You know, you're looking at a Sarmiento. Well, you might not be able to have a, a, a big thermoplastic thing, but you know, maybe you've got a piece of wood that can be shaved down and sanded around and we can use some sort of bandage on either side um, of, you know, wood on either side wrapped with a bandage and it can provide that same compressive force as my fancy plastic material can. So, you know, look, look at what your local resources are so that it is sustainable. Thank if you. I, if I may ask, is it possible for you to back up to the slide where we talk about the length and depth of yes. the splint? And can you just give a quick recap on that, please? Sure. All right. So let me see. I think it's. I think it's that same one there. This one? So yes. So force being applied. The, is that it? The next, the one with the triangles. 
Ah, so this is your lever system. Mm -hmm. So um, having your length two thirds up right. uh -huh. the arm um, in order to provide that lever, the appropriate lever arm across the joint, especially of the wrist. Um, the length of the depth needs to be at the border. So I, I know you like this one, but this next one breaks it down a little bit more as well. Right. Um, uh -huh. Having the orthosis coming up to the edges of the forearm as opposed mm -hmm. to past the edges or going below the edges. And that's your depth, right? So we don't want the depth too shy because if it's too shy, it may not be giving us adequate stability. Plus, if it's too shy, it could be causing pressure areas on either side. So we want it to come up to the edge of the forearm so that when we apply our straps, our straps can make contact with the skin. So your length and your depth and uh, width uh, depending on how much. So, you know, when we look at the girth of the forearm, you know, some people have real Popeye forearms, so it's real thin here and you need to provide more uh, material at the forearm base. So looking at all of those things. And then your angles. So the force angle, if you're doing a mobilizing force at 90 degrees of pull, centered over the space that you are, are um, looking at. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Diana. This was great. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Good luck, you guys. And, um, and yeah, you feel free to, um, to share my email address, uh, Kate, and, and you guys can feel free to, to email me if you have further questions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Kate? Yes. Can you send me that email for her, please? Because remember, I sent you a question um, about the splinting material. Uh, 